Good morning, everyone. My name is Brett Henderson, external wholesaler uh, based in the BC region. And today I'm your host for the breakout session entitled Trust, the story of a successful family enterprise and their journey with a trusted business advisor. We're fortunate enough to have two people uh, presenting today. Um, in past, uh, or no um, stranger to elite in the past, we have Peter Seligman of Seligman and Associates, as well as Hemel Belsera, uh, a member of our tax and state planning team. I'm going to introduce, uh, give a few comments about them uh, in, in just a second. But before I do, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, as your host, I will be keeping track of all the questions. We're going to keep the questions till the end of the uh, presentation. If you type them in the chat box, um, I will see them and acknowledge them, and we will. We, we aim to have roughly around 15 minutes for to answer questions uh, after the presentation. Really excited to introduce Peter Seligman as president of Seligman and Associates. It's Peter's mission to combine expert knowledge with a caring approach to guide their clients so they are able to preserve their wealth for future generations. This empowers the individuals, families, and businesses that they work with to, serve, to feel confident about their future and enjoy a continuity of their lifestyle and have the freedom to make desirable choices. When uh, Peter's not in the office, you can find him on one of many mountaintops. Uh, recently just learned that um, he skied much of Europe and, and is a very avid skier. Secondly, joining us, we have Hemel Balsera, uh, AVP, uh, Tax and Retirement and Estate Planning. Hemel joined Manulife in 2011 after spending six years in the tax area of a national accounting firm where he researched and analyzed complicated tax issues. He also spent two years in, in uh, the audit practice. He's a valued member of our team and works with wholesalers and advisors on uh, complex co uh, client files and providing value, uh, valuable knowledge. With that, I'd like to uh, let you guys take it away and look forward to hearing this great presentation. Perfect, thanks Brett. Good day, everyone. Hi, Hi Emil. Hey, hey, Peter, how are you, man? We're good, we're good. Awesome. Good, good, good day, everyone. I'm, I'm sincerely excited to be presenting to you today. This presentation is a little bit different than what you're used to for me. It's going to be a lot less tax technical and a lot more interaction and asking questions to my co-presenter and advisor that's familiar to so many in our industry, Peter Seligman, about his journey with one of his largest clients. What makes this journey inspiring is not only did Peter end up completing one of the largest deals of his career, but in the process, more importantly, he became a trusted business and personal advisor, problem solver, and friend to this client. Before I steal any thunder uh, from the rest of this presentation, let's jump into this. So, like I said, this is going to be interview style. We're going to introduce you to the clients, understand how we helped, and discuss family enterprise related matters as these issues come up more and more on our clients. Uh, as, as, as Brett mentioned, Peter is a founding partner of Seligman Insurance, and for nearly 60 years, mm -hmm. Seligman Insurance has helped their clients take the guesswork out of insurance by making the process as simple, efficient, and painless as possible. Originally founded by Sam Seligman, that handsome gentleman in the picture, uh, uh, Peter's father, Seligman Insurance was established to meet the needs of growing families, professionals, and businesses in the GTA uh, in 1982, Peter joined the company, followed by two, in 2014 by Peter's son-in-law, Jeff Bernstein. Before we jump into this, Peter, I do have a question for you. How did your father's experience impact your career? Well, my father came out of the clothing industry and uh, where he was not successful. It was not his way of being things. And it was actually his own insurance agent who suggested he come into the business. And Dad did so in 1962, and as you can see by the graphic on the right, in 1966, he was the number one salesperson for Confederation Life worldwide. He, uh, he worked hard. So the, the advantage of having multi-generational aspects, my, my dad to myself, myself to Jeff, was the ability to bounce ideas off of one another, learn from experience, uh, bring new facets into things. You know, when I got into the business, it was just starting to be computerized. I remember visiting my dad's office as a young boy and my dad had a physical rate manual on his desk, a binder, and it would go up and down by age and across and cost per thousand, et cetera. And, and then uh, you know, he was very excited when his secretary got a Selectra IBM typewriter. That was the ball with the erasable, you could backstop and erase. 
you know, since that time, obviously things have changed, but even the next generation, Jeff is bringing to our office things that I've never done before. We are totally digitizing our files. We're almost finished now, which is a big job after almost 40 years in the business. Um, we are doing more webinar type Zoom, FaceTime type correspondence and, and inter inter exchange with clients. And where I use face-to-face -face marketing, Jeff is providing marketing by way of social networking, which I, is not my thing, but I totally appreciate where it's come. So each generation builds upon the previous generation, but the continuity, the continuity of having us all on the same page, taking care of our clients, now taking care of a third and sometimes fourth generation client, which is really quite amazing, actually. Um, so there's a name in the industry. We're, in the, we're based in Toronto. Um, all of these things add to our credibility and add to the relationships we have with our clients. And it's always been a relationship-based firm. It's not a technical firm. It's not a transactional firm. We are very much relationship-based. And that's what this talk is going to be all about. And that's a great, you bring up such a great point, Peter. And and it sounds like, you know, being a multi-generational firm can help you relate to your clients. Do you think that this is an advantage for you guys as, as a firm being able oh, to relate to clients? Oh, a hundred percent. Because the, the way of the previous generation doing something is not the way of the current generation. It's also letting go of the reins. You know, it, it's very interesting. Uh, Jeff has been in the business, I think it's six years now, seven years. And a couple of years ago became the managing partner of our practice so that I can focus on the clients that I want to focus on. And quite frankly, at this stage of my career, take a bit more time off to go skiing and do other things. <laughs> uh, but what happens when it's multi-generational, you can relate to another owner who's bringing their uh, somebody up. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a family member, but a junior staff member up to become an executive staff member to ultimately take over the reins. So it does give you that insight. From an academic point of view, a number of years ago, I received my FEA designation, that's Family Enterprise Advisor designation. Uh, and that was extremely helpful to understand the dynamics within closely held corporations, whether they're family or tight knit, and who the stakeholders are and what their concerns are. And many of their concerns are not technical. And we'll get into that and why this particular situation that we're gonna be talking about resulted from and because of certain family dynamics and certain abilities to see the, I'll call it the softer side of the case, as opposed to the technical factual side of the case. Absolutely. No, thanks, Peter. I, I agree with you. Like I'm in the process of doing my FEA as well. And I just find that it just opens up a, a, such a richer conversation. So with that, let's, let's jump in and let's actually meet these clients. Uh, you know, Peter, talk to me about this client. Okay. Very simple. Um, the clients were sister and brother. Um, there were actually three children in the in three children of the original G1, G2. So they were actually third generation. This is a corporation uh, manufacturer in the greater Toronto area, well known within their community. Um, both G1, generation one and generation two have subsequently passed away. Uh, the sister and the brother and a third brother by the name of Robert uh, inherited potentially the business. Uh, Robert was a medical doctor having no interest in the business and he was bought out about 15 years ago at a very generous amount above market above market for sure he was also taken care of though whereby um, upon the death of their father generation two the last one rather than receiving a third of inheritance he received 50 percent and that was done so that there was a minimization of animosity. And I'm saying a minimization because there's always going to be a feeling that somebody didn't get paid enough or somebody paid too much. Um, the question is how do you mitigate that as best as possible? And the fourth generation, because both Richard and Jane have their own children, uh, they're not interested in the business. Um, it's a wonderful business. It was a, it was a wonderful business, but they're not interested in it. They have their own areas of interest, their own areas of expertise. And you'll come to later on in the program, the re one of the reasons for selling the business was the ability to give each of the children of Jane and Richard the wherewithal to expand and develop their own interests and their own expertise. That's really Perfect. it. Okay, and great. We can break, and now we can go down, dig a little deeper into Jane and Richard if you want. 
Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I, I just, I, I just had a couple of questions in regards sure. to, to to Robert. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, he he was offered some um, extra consideration, and uh, um, you know, you mentioned that, that this might have created some issues, uh, you know, with the siblings. How did that play out in your mind? Well, I wasn't around at that time, so I, I can't address from personal experience. But I do know that um, at the time determining a fair price, um, both Richard and Jane overcompensated to a degree that was generous, probably an extra 25% over the value of that, as well as ultimately leading to the additional inheritance when generation, when their father passed away. Um, they're okay now, uh, but in any business dealings of family and value and, and expe the expectations are there, it was tough, but they've, they've, come, they've come to be in a really okay place now, uh, really okay place now. But it was definitely, definitely tough at, at that point, for sure. Okay, perfect. And then just one last question on, on, on the general background here. Um, you know, sometimes when assets are passed down multiple generations, sometimes, you know, you know families view them as legacy assets um, where they want to pass it on to the next generation. I, I guess this really ties into G4, and you touched upon this a little bit. But yeah, I, know, you, I know what you're getting at. I, I can address that. For sure, generation two and generation three, generation three being my clients, were legacy, for sure. No question about that. But by the time they had gone through what they've gone through in the last 15, 20 years, they realized that going to a fourth generation would be very difficult because even generation one had three founding partners. Then generation two, the father of my clients, ended up buying out the other two. And at each level, it became more and more difficult. And when you have multiple children for generation four, it becomes ever more so. So they took the route that, uh, and none of the children had this burning desire to work there during the summers and on school holidays and that kind of thing. They all worked hard in their own fields. They were, you know, they were very, um, you know, they were definitely privileged, but not spoiled. Uh, definitely not well I know the kids and they work hard at what they do uh, but it really wasn't a legacy situation in this particular situation had it been a legacy we would have come up with a different solution but it absolutely wasn't. absolutely solution. Perfect. perfect and we learned that by discussions with the clients which we'll get into great and with that let's let's meet Jane um, you know appreciate the high level understanding uh, can, can you tell me more about Jane Okay, so uh, Jane is a contemporary of mine. I actually knew her uh, during late high school and early university years and you know, as, as casual acquaintances. No, we never dated. Uh, <laughs> That's where my mind went, man. <laughs> uh, answering the question that people are asking, no. Uh, um, and uh, she went her own way. She got her MBA from a well-recognized school and really was the inside. If you want to simplify it, Jane was absolutely the inside person and uh, you'll come to it. Richard was the outside sales guy. So she handled all the financing as, as indicated here. She handled all the staffing, all the manufacturing, all, all the inside aspects of everything. Um, her spouse is not involved in the business. They have three children, all of post-university age now. Um, and what happened is about 10 years ago, um, I've been involved in community as many of the people watching know. And Jane and I happened to sit on a committee for one of these charities. And it was nice to get reacquainted and we catch up, talk and maybe go out for coffee either after or before and started to talk about different things um, as it related to my business, as it related to her business, as it related to family dynamics. And ultimately Jane said, you know, we've got a couple of issues and I'd love you to talk to, talk to about, about it. So she actually was the one who introduced the, the business discussion based on the personal discussions we had had and uh, the trust that had developed working together, having nothing to do with the insurance industry at all. Okay, that's well, that's that's it, it, were the charitable activities kind of planned? Like, did you guys always talk about doing charitable activities no, or was it no, just a coincidence? Just, just totally coincidental. I'm involved in a number of different things as is she. And this particular one, we both happened to come together at the same time in the same place. And, enjoyed each other along with uh, the other members of the committee that we were working on and learned to what we were. Now we knew each other basically as kids. And now we were seeing each other as adults. Nice. It's, it's, it's different, but there was the continuity there. And, and I knew her extended family through the community anyway. So it wasn't like 
meeting a stranger from 20, we had bumped into each other occasionally. So it wasn't as if it was completely brand new, but we had never really been social friends before in any great way. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I feel, you know, what you're saying and it's just, you know, for, for many of the advisors on the line today, right. You know, sometimes taking that conversation from being charitable or, or, you know, just talking about things from a social aspect and now taking it to the next level in terms of business, was that, how was that conversation or how did that go? Or how did she, how did this even get the, the business snowball start, get, start moving? Uh, I, I pretty simple, actually, you know, you're talking about the chair and you're focused on them and you talk about families and what you've gone through and positives and negatives. And you start talking about your children and what their interests are. And, and I can bring to the table, you know, she was bringing her own story to the table. And I brought to the, to the table, my story, of, you know, my own personal journey with my family, uh, my journey in the insurance business and what I've done. And quite frankly, attending and, and being a graduate of the FEA program, the Family Enterprise Advisor Program, because it changes your way of looking at things. Um, and it's a course that I favor strongly that allows you to see the other perspectives of the business, not just the accounting or legal, but what are the dynamics? And she felt comfortable in saying, oh, we have some issues we need to deal with here. We have some positives and we have some negatives. We need some help. I'd like you to take a look at something. And, and then that brought the next stage, which is the brother Richard into the picture, who I didn't know from Adam. I had never met Richard. So Richard is uh, actually a little old, uh, sorry, a little younger um, than, uh, than Jane. And yet, uh, and he's the outside guy. He's in sales, he's in marketing, he's in design, customer relations, all that kind of stuff. And he's very good at what he does. So Jane and Richard make a very, very good team. But I didn't know Richard at all, zero. I had never met him. I'd heard his name in passing, but I had never met him. And where Jane's personality is analytical, very detailed, um, very logical, et cetera, um, very um, think with the head, um, Richard's more with the heart. And so meeting him, initially he was very skeptical because I was Jane's guy, right? I'm Jane's guy from the point of view as an advisor. So it took a long time to really get on his side. You know, Jane would vet our agreements, our uh, recommendations, I should say, very technically. And along with the CFO of the company, uh, who reported to both Jane and to Richard, um, we really did a tremendous amount of analysis, et cetera. Uh, um, and then Richard was more uh, a question of winning over his heart. I can only tell you that now Richard um, is n not just a client, but... Um, we become friends of our own because he knows that I've the conversations I've had with him have been not shared with anybody else, not shared with Jane, not shared with the CFO, not shared with anyone else. And he's, he's, he knows that. So he learned to trust me. And as I told you in a conversation a while ago, every once in a while, he'll send me an email that's a little off color, but it's a fun guy type of stuff. So he's gotten comfortable with the whole situation. And that's going to lead hopefully to a little bit more business, which we'll discuss momentarily. Um, but as I said, um, it took time. Uh, it was not overnight. I've known these guys now for about 10 to 12, uh, let me figure out, how, uh, somewhere in the 10 to 15 year range, I have to break it down specifically. And I've been with them through a number of different iterations that they had uh, as to where they're going. Um, I think we just lost our picture. We lose that, Hemel? I just lost the graphic. Hamill, you're on mute. Hey, Peter. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, something. Here we go. Okay, Hamill's frozen for anybody who can watch me right now. So the. Um, Let's just share you know, that again. I was saying, I was saying, you, hey, Peter? You were I was saying that you were just frozen. A lot yeah. of my meetings with the clients were not in the office. A lot of the meetings were one-on-one -on -one outside the office, primarily longer lunches. And I'm not talking about martini lunches. That's not my style. 
but where I allowed a lot of time. So often the lunches would be two and a half, three hours, and they were conversations. They were um, really actively listening. In fact, people may not know the term actively listening, but after a good interview, after a good discussion, I'm actually really tired because active listening takes a lot of energy because you're, you're participating. You're not, you're not being a passenger. You're actively participating in the process of having a dialogue with them. Um, Emily, you there, you're frozen again, buddy. And I'll continue in case I'm on. I'm not sure whether I'm on or not. Uh, you're, you're on, Peter. I can, I can see you. You're, you sound okay. perfect. I yeah. wasn't sure. I was frozen. Okay. So let, let me continue. So through these discussions, you become a, a trusted individual. And the, the key role here is to really listen. And uh, for those who know of um, an individual name of Hal Zlotnick, Hal was an icon in the business. Um, Hal was... Um, out in the Vancouver area, um, his son Gary and, and other sons are in the business as well. And um, he, he wrote um, the book, The Broad Concept, which is really asking a short, meaningful question and actually just staying quiet and listening. What you'll find is that most um, CEOs, owners of businesses, et cetera, are actually quite isolated or even sometimes lonely in that they are limited in how much they can discuss with their staff, a little less limited, but still somewhat so with their chief executive officers, hesitant sometimes to bring their spouses in, or family members into the discussion for fear of worrying them or whatever, or not worrying them, but not having expertise. So to, to have the ability to sit and listen and have somebody talk to you and you actually listening to them is a big is a big favor for, not favor wrong word is is a big motivator for them. Um, so how Zlotnick developed this with a, a few others this broad concept approach, asking a straightforward but meaningful question. A great one to ask somebody. A great one is how did you get into this business? It's as simple as that. Hemel, you asked me that sort of before, but ask that question. And then to quote Joe Dickstein, who unfortunately passed away this past year, another icon in the business, he said to me, God created you with one mouth and two ears, and that's the proportion you should be using them in. And I truly believe in that. Now, along that line is a, 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 a graphic that we you see here, um, and I'm going to uh, give credit to Rory Vaden. Uh, Rory spoke at KLU about three or four years ago. And I was blown away by it because what he did is he took a two dimensional graph, important, not important on the, on, the, on the horizontal and urgent, not urgent on the vertical. And we all know that what's important and urgent upper left, what's not important and not urgent on the lower right. But there's some things that are significant that ha are neither important or not important nor urgent or not urgent. So the idea of sharing a meal, breaking bread with someone and really listening to them, it's not urgent, it's not not urgent either. It's not necessarily important subject matters or unimportant, but the significance of building that trust, taking that time. I will tell everybody who's listening, and my father taught this to me a long time ago, a client or a prospect can smell whether you need the business or not, and they can tell whether you're really taking care of them. They will feel it. They will feel the positive energy towards them or they'll feel the positive energy towards you. They will feel that. They will recognize that. And I've always had a long-term approach to things. As I mentioned, this is my 39th year in the business. Can't believe it. Um, and uh, that's been the best part of the whole business. So I'm just glancing at some notes here. That's the best part of the whole business, the significance part. You know, what's high, what's low, you don't know, but it'll, it'll turn out in due course to be very important. And it was those chats, it was those questions, it was the listening, it was asking pointed questions where necessary, not, not being shy to be confrontational. Sorry, not being shy, not being shy to make my point, but at the same time, being sensitive to what was going on, not walking on eggshells, because sometimes you have to deal with what you have to deal with, but moving from there. Emil? 
Okay, I think Hamill is frozen. Yeah, Hamill's going in and out of uh, okay. <laughs> frozen. So, Hamill, if you can switch to the next slide, I'll then cover what happened 10 years ago. All right, let's get that slide up, Hamill. Sorry about this, guys. Whoever's watching worldwide, sorry about it, but technology is not yet perfected, but we're trying to do the best job we can. All right, Hamill, can you pull up yep. the next 10 years ago, please? Absolutely. Thank Perfect. You okay. So I was brought in and then we put on our business hat. I reviewed their shareholders agreement. I, and in multidisciplinary discussions involved, of course, their CEO, which was very important. Their CEO actually was embedded into the company. He did do, he used to be with the auditors, their accountants, and ended up hiring him. And he's been with the firm about 20 years, a very trusted guy. I actually met with him independently as well and developed a relationship with him as well. And he became a client. Um, by his own volition, he, he wanted to. Um, Peter, just just to interject over there, did that? Did you find that doing that actually made a big difference in terms of you know you, this case, your relationship with the uh, with, with the, the CFO just kind of got things over the line a little bit more? One hundred percent. The clients were on side anyway, but the CFO who did the heavy lifting from a number crunching point of view, along with Jane, quite frankly, um, he was very much in favor, and in fact. When we were on the fence about doing something very specific, he wrote an email to the two partners that was unbelievable. It was just not singing our praises, not at all, but talking about what we had recommended and so strongly supporting it. It was, the, and I think you remember the memo, Hamill, that I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's a classic. I would use that anywhere. I was like, <laughs> in fact, somebody, somebody said he should go into the business. He wrote it so well. Um, so having his trust, having his understanding, responding in a timely fashion and accurately to what they wanted. So I was brought in, I reviewed their shareholders agreement, not as a lawyer, just simply as someone in the insurance business, spotted a couple of things that might need to correct. It was pretty good by itself. Um, their current advisor had really been their father's, Generation Two's advisor. And he had done some work, but, but more transactional, I'll call it. He was selling policies, not putting things in place properly. Um, we kept all the policies, they were all fine. There was nothing wrong with them, but they hadn't taken into account uh, some of the changing dynamics between generation two and three, and certainly hadn't taken into account the possibility of generation four, which wasn't around even at the time. So in doing this, it was decided that by them that they needed uh, an additional $10 million of coverage. Um, and that's what we started the underwriting process to do. Now, at this time, the business was going through a tough time and uh, they brought in um, a venture capital partner, um, which they needed to help support the business. Uh, I know you've got a couple of questions here, Hemo. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I mean, like, with the $10 million, how was that determined as, as the... Uh, as, as the amount or the magic number. For well, that was 10 million on each of them. They already yeah. already and they already they had about 10 or 15 million on each of them in the form of mostly term to 100 type contracts. Um, they just knew what the value of the business was. They also knew that the venture capital firm coming in, if something were to happen to them, they weren't sure what the results would be by way of the value of the company going to their, very, their respective families. So they wanted to protect themselves in that area and that's, and that's why. And the venture capital was brought in simply because they needed cash flow to expand their manufacturing to get into a new area uh, that at that time uh, they didn't have the capital for. And okay. venture capitalists saw an opportunity there to get a good return on their money and they, it was a good part, it was a good relationship for quite a number of years. It was excellent right to the end. Perfect. No, that, that, that's, uh, that's awesome. I, and one of the things I just wanted to point out to the group as well is, is, is part of any uh, shareholder agreement, in this case, Opco was going to be the owner and the beneficiary, or is the owner of the, uh, and beneficiary of the policies. One of the things that you want to be aware about from a shareholder agreement perspective is, is you want to make sure that whenever a death benefit pays in, what happens is the CDA and the cash end up in the right place, right? So typically, whenever we've got two Holcos owning an Opco, the best way of structuring is actually doing a corporate redemption. And what happens is, is when we do this corporate redemption uh, and one partner passes away, effectively what would happen is, is that these Holcos would have its shares 
redeemed. And in turn, it would receive the cash and it would receive a, a dividend. And what we want to do is we want to characterize that dividend as a capital dividend. And the, what this allows is it, it creates the most tax efficient result for the deceased. And, and, and typically when we've got a shareholder agreement situation, usually both parties can kind of come to that agreement. And, and I think that's one of the things that they that, that they also worked towards was was achieving the most tax efficient result for the deceased on but this we did, But we did, uh, as you'll see, we did, as you know, we changed things down the Absolutely. line. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to make your recommendations based on the needs of the clients at the time based while on. keeping in mind flexibility for the future. And the only way you really know that, aside from looking at the hard numbers and the structure, is by having dialogue with them. What do they want? What are their wishes? What are their dreams? Exactly. So speaking of venture capital, I, I know we talked about, you know, involving the venture capital firm in terms of, 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 of uh, you know, uh, injecting capital. I, I guess, you know, what motivated the, uh, the buyout of the venture capital farmer uh, or could get venture capital partner? Well, in most cases, venture capitalists are only involved from a four to eight year period of time. They're in to raise the value of the company, take their pound of flesh, and then move on to the next one. That's, they're not into it for the long term. And that's exactly what happened here. Through their venture capital, uh, Jane and Richard were able to restructure uh, their company somewhat, their manufacturing style, what they were manufacturing, to great success, to great success. And when they were able to, uh, they approached their venture capital partners who would have received a tremendous return on their investment and were fine, it's all yours, go ahead. They didn't own shares in the business. They had a rate of return guaranteed plus an upside. So it wasn't like any future growth was gonna be realized by the venture capitalists over and above what their contracts said. So at that time it was time to get them out. And that's exactly what happened. But once that happened, because there was uh, there were dollars now being uh, added, added value for Richard and Jane because no longer were the venture capitals having to be paid out and future growth. That's when they came to me and they said, and when I say came to me, we were having ongoing discussions. So it wasn't brand new. They said, look, we need some more insurance. Okay, right now we've paid out our venture capitalists. We need more coverage in place. Um, let's, put, let's put some coverage, uh, let's put some additional coverage. And they picked a figure, and that's the next slide, they picked a fig figure of $10 million each additional. So we did that. We, we put in place, uh, we started the process of putting in place $10 million on each of them. And because there were different underwriting issues, um, differences in age, male, female, smoker, non-smoker, health style ratings, we decided to go to three different companies, Manulife and two others, to obtain the best rates we could. And this was just going to be term insurance. Why term insurance? Because they really felt they knew generation four wasn't going to be coming into the business. And in all likelihood, there had been some mild discussions with some other companies in their related business to maybe buy them out. So they didn't feel the need for additional permanent coverage from the purpose of a buy-sell agreement. During the underwriting process, we ran into some snags. We finally got both of them approved for the full $10 million, but it was a hassle. And uh, not a hassle for me, but a hassle for them. It took longer, it was a little bit aggravating. And so one of the partners came to me uh, together with the other partner, where the three of us were sitting down with the controller and they looked at each other and said, look at this business is gonna continue to grow. We're gonna need more coverage. You know what, I don't wanna go through this again can we get 15 million each? And I had underwritten for a larger amount on the if come, it wasn't a significantly different underwriting process, just a little bit more involved. And I went back to the three companies and they all agreed to, that they would give up to $15 million. So financials, the medicals, all that, it was approved, not a problem. And then came the question of, okay, who to place the coverage with? And I felt that my long-term advice was important, really important here. This is one of two different ma major things that are coming up. The second one we'll discuss in a moment. And I said, let's put 5 million with each of the three companies. Because if and when you do decide to sell the business, you might want to convert some of that coverage for your own purposes. We didn't know whether it would be for protection, for capital gains, for as an asset class, we had no idea. 
is that I, as your advisor, want to be in the position where I can literally shop the marketplace and get you the best offers I can and not being tied in with any one company who may have the flavor of the month at that particular time for a particular type of policy. The second part though, is that of this subset is that should we do something in the same way that a good financial advisor on the investment side will tell you to diversify your portfolio. I felt that we would be able to diversify whatever contracts were put in place. As it turned out, we went with three whole life contracts. And what, end, what allowed us to do then is, you know, every whole life contract will act slightly differently, will be priced slightly differently. But over the next 20 or 30 years, nobody can guarantee or tell you that company A that's outperforming company B and C today will continue to outperform them 20 years from now. So this was a way of insurance investment, if you want to call it that, averaging. And that's exactly what we ended up doing. So we put all um, all of the policies with three different companies inside the OPCO, um, knowing that at some point, if they were to sell the company, we could transfer the policies from OPCO to the hold co, their individual hold co's down the road with little or no tax um, issues unless their health had changed. And we felt that this transaction would happen in the next three to five years, which is what happened. Uh, and there were no health changes. So we were able to ultimately transfer the policies after the sale of the business, those new policies, the ones that were term insurance, we were able to transfer without any kind of tax consequence up to their individual whole coast. Perfect. Yeah, no, thanks, Peter. And, and I, just so the audience gets an appreciation of this, you know, there, there's different ways of skinning the cat when it comes to selling a business. There can be share sales or, or asset sales. And, you know, generally from a purchaser's perspective, they like to buy assets because they a, get a stepped up basis in those assets. Uh, they can cherry pick uh, the desired assets and they don't assume any of the liabilities of the corporation. For a seller, you know, generally there's a preference to sell shares because they walk away with the proceeds with one layer of tax potentially. And uh, at the end of the day, it's capital gains. If, if it's, uh, there may be the opportunity to use lifetime capital gains exemption. However, what happens is, is when there's an asset sale that's completed and there are capital gains, there may be an opportunity to cycle out a portion of the proceeds tax-free to the shareholders via the CDA because one half of the capital gain is taxable, one half of the gain is non-taxable. And there may be an opportunity for tax deferral by leaving a portion of the proceeds behind in the corporation. For proceeds that are left behind in the corporation, there can be an opportunity to take advantage of some of that deferral by making it permanent, by putting a a portion of the sale proceeds into a life insurance policy. And ultimately that policy is gonna benefit from tax deferred growth, tax-free receipt of the death benefit, and ultimately the ability to uh, pay a tax-free capital dividend out to the estate. And this process ultimately makes that deferral permanent as the life insurance becomes really a CDA creation tool. The only catch is, is obviously you have to die, right? So you can't have them all, right? So, but, but, but anyways, my point with this is, is, is th- that's the beauty of the planning that, that, that Peter planted the seeds on. That's the beauty of, of, of really what this case has is, is really been focused on is, is, is really that, the, the a the deferral opportunity that's available when you do a, a sale transaction but then b being able to cycle a portion of those proceeds into a life insurance policy and ultimately benefit from the cda creation mechanism and, and for those of you who are interested in, in in sale planning and learning a lot more about sale transactions uh please tune in tomorrow carrie lee and i are doing a presentation about this so now that we have a little bit of context um you know tell us a little bit more about the the insurance plans that we were we were looking at in terms of the client. All right, so let's back up. So they were approached by a U.S. firm, and their company was bought out for the neighborhood of 150 million dollars. Wow, very significant dollars. Um, the partners themselves were very generous. They had um, with their employees. They had lots of long-term employees, and they gave everyone two-year severance even if they were rehired by the new corporation. Everyone got two years severance and they closed down uh, inventory, et cetera. They closed some locations, but everyone was treated really, really well. Uh, We then are sitting with insurance policies, both um, earlier ones set up in Holco, which were mostly term to 100 or limited pay type contracts or 
the and sorry and the three five million dollar policies that we put in place through um, just recently in, in those previous years. So the first thing we did is we transferred out, as I mentioned earlier, we transferred out the fifteen million dollars on each of them up to their personal hold code. There was no tax issue here. There was no value to the policies. They were still in the same good health. And the reason they were originally placed inside Opco was because they were for a, a shareholders agreement and Absolutely. they wanted that way. We did discuss, we did discuss putting those new policies inside their individual hold codes, but it was their decision for reasons that were theirs to put them inside Opco. But we did, we did address that because normally when I do set these things up, I usually have the owner be the whole co and the beneficiary be the opco so that if the opco is ever sold there's never any deemed disposition but because there was term insurance and little risk of any kind of significant um, gain or taxable transfer that's one of the reasons they did it there also made it easier for paying for the premiums because as i said each of them were of a different age a different sex a different smoker status and a different health styles so this allowed them to pay out of one location, shared equally by both of them, the, the full amount of the coverage. And that's exactly what happened. So that's, that's, that's what happened to them. And then each of them individually um, um, talk, then did their own conversions. I think it's the next slide, I think. Yeah, so um, in this situation, post-transfer, now Jane had, in addition to the 15 million, they each had two and a half million dollars of term insurance that was an OPCO prior to my coming on board. That was already there. And I had become the agent of record, et cetera, et cetera. So what ended up happening is that Jane decided after a complete review to convert the full $17.5 million into a whole life max fund policy. Now we had looked at all kinds of options. That wasn't the initial go-to. We looked at the term to 100, we looked at limited pay UL, we looked at basic funding of whole life on a limited pay basis, and then we looked at overfunding. But as you said a few minutes ago, this was an opportunity to take what would normally be tax, taxable dollars if pulled out of their opcos to make it virtually a non-taxable death benefit by way of insurance. You know, obviously the longer they live, the less tax there is, but that's what was decided. So Jane went for the full Monty, as they say. She did convert the full 17 and a half. And Richard um, initially only did 10 million and then subsequently did another two and a half million about eight months later. In fact, backdated it almost a full year for some personal planning purposes. He did that in part for charity as well, as did Jane. They wanted the coverage. So uh, right now, Jane is sitting with 17 and a half million of permanent whole life. Richard is sitting with 12 and a half. And we are right now at the beginning of the second policy year for all of them. They obviously have different policy dates, but we have been working very closely with them and with their bank and lender to help with the immediate financing range, which we'll, which we'll get into. And I think we're making it so easy for them. I think there might be I feel there might be a, a real chance of Richard converting that last five million. Um, he actually asked me about it about a month ago. Uh, they, you know, how long do I have until I can do this kind of thing? So, you know, um, I want to be sensitive to his age near us. So, come this spring, we'll we'll know what's going on because he changes age uh, sometime in in the early summer. So, uh, uh, from an insurance point of view, so it worked worked out beautifully. They're very happy. As I said, the controller was very, very much involved in it. But we had a problem. So, um, so individually, they took care of their own 17 and a half. As I said, James converted all of it. Richard got 12 and a half converted and five sitting there doing just with term insurance, all inside his opco. Of course, tremendous amount of paperwork and that kind of thing. Um, but really, um, so they made their own individual decisions. The issue really was what to do with all the policies owned by Opco that were of a permanent nature of which they were paying different premium amounts. And, and Peter, can I just inter interject sure. for one second? I, I noticed that, you know, obviously they're looking at the IFA and they're working with their bankers, but what motivated the decision to do uh, deferred leveraging? So instead of doing the IFA immediately waiting a year and then okay. getting into the great IFA. Great question. Sorry, we sort of skipped that. 
Well, first of all, they looked at the IFA and they just saw the credit to the capital dividend account and it blew them out of the water because the, the excess of the capital dividend account over the borrowed amount would go directly against the other assets they had inside of OPCO. So not only would they get the insurance proceeds out tax-free and therefore the premiums that were used to fund that, but because they were leveraging it, um, they could see that the CDA is not based on the net amount after, after loan, it's based on the gross amount. And that gross amount will allow them each to pull out about 10 to $15 million each of additional tax-free capital. So it was a super win. It also, the amount of the premium also represents a very small portion of their overall investable assets, especially if they're doing what they're doing, which is the immediate financing. So really what they've done is they paid the first premium fully. Why did they do that rather than borrow it back immediately? Because they didn't want to have to assign other assets. They wanted to keep it clean. They could afford it. They said, okay, we'll do the first year we'll pay. And then every year thereafter, it's a, re it's a revolving door of money in and money out. So they've committed X plus X, X being committed full-time and X going in and out, in and out, in and out, which represents a very small amount of their net worth in the grand scheme of it. You then, so there's little cash flow required. It's not taking away from their other investments. And they have this huge CDA ability down the road. And they have more money already in the app, in the tax-free portion of their sale than they'll ever need in their lifetime. And they know it. In fact, they're looking at using some of the insurance policies for charity and things of that nature. That'll be the next step after this particular seminar where we're gonna sit down with them and their charities and say, okay, not to sell more insurance, but how can we, how, how do you wanna use this insurance to benefit others? So not only is it minimal cash flow, great return on, on investment, huge CDA credit, but it can go towards some amazing charitable things in their lifetime um, that they commit to. So overall, they're, they are very happy people right now. Very happy, which is nice. Perfect. No, I, and, and just for the benefit of the audience, let you know, coming back to like some sample numbers. Let's just say, for example, we had twenty-five million dollars of death benefit, uh, uh, ten million dollar loan, and a zero ACB. That means the corporation is only getting fifteen million dollars of cash. However, what happens is, is you actually get CDA, like Peter mentioned, of the gross twenty-five million dollars. So effectively, what we're able to do is create extra CDA that can allow you to strip out other assets. So this, this is where it, it, you know the IFA strategy that Peter suggested ran so so well with the with all of the uh, deferral strategies that the professional advisors worked with uh, Peter on on this. Right, so it worked out really really well. So the interesting thing about that, when we first approached them about it, they were totally skeptical. Yeah. Like, how, how can this be? And we said, no, this is tax act. This is how it works. And, and they ran it by their accountants, their tax accountants. Their CFO was a very bright guy and, he, and was a, an accountant by himself, a CA, but a very high level CA. He looked at the numbers and he said, you guys would be crazy <laughs> not to do this. In fact, I think those are the words that he used in the memo. Yeah. Um, we like got this copy of this memo, we couldn't believe it. And they did it. Um, and that's why I think there's a, a portion that still may be outstanding for Richard that he'll look at doing because it, it's, not, it's not costing him, it's not taking away from his investable assets in any great way. And it's certainly not taking away from his lifestyle in any great way. And we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to add in here and I've got to comment and, and credit Hemel on this one for whoever's listening. I could not have done this without Hemel's help. There's no way I could have done this. This is out of my uh, pay range, out of my clearance. Um, it was above my pay grade, for sure, in the technical aspect. I also brought somebody else and a technical partner into it who's done the number crunching. Um, my business has always been based on a full, full knowledge, full disclosure, and recognizing where I don't have the expertise that I need. I am very happy to bring in another partner uh, to help me close a case and to do what's right for the client. Actually, let's reverse the order. To do what's right for the client first, and then if it turns out, close the case, so be it. So that partner has helped not only initially, but is now helping with two other things, which we'll get to. Um, one is how to deal with the existing policies in place, through the OPCO and what we did to deal with that, which are, the slide is up now, and then ultimately what to do with the IFA financing. So here we have two partners 
total amounts of coverage are a little bit different inside the opco or remaining inside the opco they've already pulled out their 17 and a half but they have varying amounts that are almost identical but not identical but their premiums are all over the place in different so what i came up with was simple they left it inside the op opco remember they had sold the assets of the opco not the opco so they left the insurance proceeds inside the opco and those are the only assets inside the opco everything else has been stripped out the only thing left inside opco are the insurance policies so what they've done is they set up a pool of funds collectively they've left it so they haven't dividend up all the money out of the opco to their personal household they left a chunk of money inside the opco that chunk of money will go to continue paying the premiums on those opco policies upon the first to die of the two partners the proceeds of the life insurance on the deceased partner are paid out 50 50 by way of the capital dividend account to each of the shareholders which happen to be the whole coast at that point, then obviously the premium amounts required are reduced because you're only carrying half of the number of policies and the remaining funds will stay in there. Some may be distributed if it's over the amount that they require, I mean the capital I'm talking about, and they'll keep on going until the second death. Upon the second death, again, 50-50 is distributed and any remaining capital is also distributed 50-50. And at that point, the opco will be closed down. So what we did is, A, we came up with this concept for them, which they liked, because it mitigated any family dynamics of, I'm paying more for less and you're paying less for more and, you know, dad loved you more than he loved me kind of thing, um, which is always that little bit when there's always family members doing do different jobs, which were both instrumental in the success of the business, but there's always a sibling rivalry of some kind going on. You know, he, she or he is taking more time off than I am, this kind of thing. But this was an area that we were able to completely mitigate any differentiation because everybody's paying into it out of a common pot for a common good, for a common benefit. And what one of the things we did, though, is they said, well, how much would this cost? So we actually, my partner, the, the, the technician, uh, not Hemel, someone else I'm talking about, actually did the number crunching. We actually said, okay, we know the premiums. We know some of them are limited pay and some of them are lifetime pay. Let's speculate here. Let's pick an interest rate that we're comfortable with. And we did two different interest rates. And then we did two different scenarios. One being the first death at age 90 and the second death at age 95. Why that long out? Because we knew we'd be covering our butts by making sure there was enough funds in there, not underfunding. That's the last thing we wanted to do. So that's why we didn't use 80, 85 or 85, 90. We figured we'd go for the long haul 90, 95. And then we, and then we reversed who died first to see what the requirements would be after the first death and what the refund should be or, or they can take out the capital. So they were very appreciative of that. And that's a side agreement that they've, they've developed. Uh, I haven't actually seen the agreement, but I know the context, we wrote them a full memo. They were very appreciative of it. They did it. So that's fine. I don't need to see the legal document. There was no insurance involved specifically. It was just a way of addressing inequality. Because you have Absolutely. to distinguish between what's equal and what's equitable. Okay, in this situation, they wanted equal and we've dealt with that. So the final piece of the puzzle um, was actually dealing right now with what we're dealing with, which is the IFA financing. And the technician I'm working with is much more attuned to this, has done many, I've only done a few of these. So my expertise is very limited, um, but I recognize that. So I, when I'm limited, I bring in somebody else. And what happened here is, um, we, on behalf of the client, went to a number of different uh, lenders, including the client's own bankers, which ultimately we're using because there's a relationship there. But the lenders came back with certain features uh, that weren't favorable to the client. And, our, and we approached the lender with permission of the client and renegotiated things like prime versus prime and a half, things like a lower, a lower renewal fee, things like a longer guarantee of interest rates, things of that nature that the client wouldn't know to ask. So those are value added. We're not being paid for it in any hourly way, nor do we. I was paid very handsomely, as was my partner in this. So I really, we've, we've done full circle. And I think we're coming close to the end of our time now. In fact, we're very close. Uh, I just, just wanted to, rem we've got five minutes. So just okay. so you know where we're at. All right. So there's a summary, relationships, 
you know, slowly overcoming somebody's skepticism, the broad concept. Um, I'm definitely a relationship advisor, not a transactional one, never have been. Um, we diversified the portfolio, the insurance portfolio, which they're very happy with now. We did it originally with term, but ultimately we've done it with the whole life policy. And they know they're going to perform differently. They know that. But on average, rather than putting everything into one pot, they can income average or insurance average or performance average over the three companies, and they'll be extremely well off, and so will the next generation. So it worked out great, and I've developed a really, really lovely relationship with both of the clients, independent of each other, because other than the insurance, the common insurance opco, they have no business relationship with each other at all. They're great friends. They're great siblings. But now there's no business to deal with other than some minor windup. Perfect. Thanks, like, Peter. And I, like, and I like that picture of me skiing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. As with with, with as that, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you, Peter, for the generosity of your time and knowledge sharing. You know, it takes guts to present to a group of your peers, and I think you did amazing as well. I, I personally wanted to thank you for including Manulife and I on your journey with this client. I, I know I was involved for a sliver of this process, but I appreciate the confidence and trust in my abilities to be part of your team. And for those of you online, I also wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you for your business and thank you for tuning in. Peter's story has been one of a true success story built on trust. I hope you found this insightful and let's open it up to questions. So Brett. Bet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first question was, uh, did they use LCGE when they did the restructure? I believe that was before the sale. Health? The lifetime capital gains exemption. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think they did. Peter. I don't think so. Actually. No, but but it was more because it was like from from the lens of of uh, the, the, the given the size of the transaction, like the yeah, it, it, was, it was you know a lifetime capital gains exemption these days is worth about two hundred thousand dollars, which is which is it, yeah. I, which, don't, I don't even think we talked about it. It was negligible. Yeah. Exactly, because because they were working with like uh, one of the big accounting firms, and they came up with a deferral plan as part of this deal, right? So at the end of the day, you know, the, the deferral plan provided way more benefit than uh, you know worrying about the lifetime yeah, capital gains exactly. exemption. But right. but it would be a consideration if we were looking at some smaller numbers in that right. situation. Excellent. Uh, second question: Was the transfer of the policy from Offco to Hold Co done before the 2017 tax changes? No, after. Okay. And then a follow a follow up to that regarding uh, fair market value um, valuations. Uh, did you uh, uh, hire an actuary to, even though it was term, uh, to give a, a true fair market value assessment? We had we had somebody take a look at it. They said they were of negligible value, like it was, exactly. wasn't even worth dealing with because they were only three years old at the time. The policies and because there had been no health change, no substantial age change, we had somebody take a casual look at it. We didn't do a formal one because there wasn't, we knew that we, we would have done a formal one had it been required, but he came back, the actuary came back and said, this is a very simple situation. There's no real gain here. By the way, I do want to mention, because we're going to be limited in time. If anybody wants to ask me a specific question, they can email me at peter at seligman, S-E-L-I-G-M-A-N dot C-A. Peter at Seligman .ca, and I'd be very happy to respond to them. I'm sorry that we went a little longer. You never know how. Oh how no, you, we've, we're uh, we're right on. We've got two minutes. Um, that that I don't have any other questions on the board. So if anyone has any, we'll uh, we can stick around for for a couple right. more minutes while you know, we wait. I, yeah. If I Go may, ahead. if we've got two minutes, if I may, it's sort of a closing thing. Um, I found a very interesting question that I asked both my clients. And I've asked our backup people, that being people at Manulife or any other company, it's a very simple question. What do you need to make this happen? What do you need to make this happen? It empowers you, it empowers the client, it empowers the advisor support people, the insurance company. And sometimes they'll come back and say, Peter, there's nothing you can do here. You know, the guy's got a heart condition or a family history or the finances aren't in place, et cetera. But often they'll come back and they'll say, I'm glad you asked, because if you got this done, if you got this additional piece of information, if perhaps you got this additional medical test done, which may be invasive and the client has to recognize that and, and manual life or anybody else isn't going to pay for it. I have actually paid over the last 39 years for a few medical tests myself where the client you know, didn't want to spend the 500,000 or $2,000, but it was a big enough situation. Um, and it's worthwhile to go that extra mile. 
So that's a very empowering question that I mm -hmm. wanted to pass on to my colleagues here. You know, I miss face to face. I've been to almost every one of the elites over the last 30 years. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> that's kind of scary. I've missed a couple of them, but not many. And some of them were not to my own, weren't under my control and people who know me know why. Um, but it's been a, a extreme value and I'll definitely be there in Arizona next year. And anybody who wants to hoof up Camelback with me, I'm pleased to have a good hike up there. It's a great hike. Um, it's been my honor to be on this. Uh, I think this is the third or fourth time I presented it at an elite conference and I find it's my way of giving back. And as I say on my website, to move forward, you got to give back and that in every part of this, every part of life. And that includes giving back to the business. So sure. yeah. go for it. Look at, look at taking the FEA program, look at joining KALU, uh, look at attending seminars like this. And um, again, I want to thank all of you. Okay, right. one, we've got one more question, but for those sure. of you who uh, want to jump off, we are starting a 20 minute break uh, and we will be back on the main stage. If you go to the lobby and go to the main stage starting at 310 Eastern, where Karen Cutler and Selena Puttick will give uh, their underwriting uh, update and discussion. So uh, if you will, one more question, uh, sure. Peter. Yeah, okay. So in your opinion, as insurance advisors, what is our role in a multi-generational business owner transition prior to the transition? Making sure that all the stakeholders are heard. Hmm. Okay, and, and that doesn't mean people involved in the business necessarily. What about the kids? What about the spouse? Like make sure they're heard and what their wishes are because maybe there's a kid who really does want to get involved in the business or maybe the kid really doesn't want to be involved in the business. Um, listen to all the stakeholders. And as I said, stakeholders are not necessarily in ownership or actively participating in the business. They can just be family members or related to family members. Like how, who's affected by this? And then, and then look at it from a very broad concept point of view. Who's impacted by this? That's what I would do. And if it involves having independent meetings with the knowledge of the owner of the business, with their children, with their spouse, one-on-one, -on -one, ensuring confidentiality, that kind of thing. I'll tell you, we talked about that chart, of, uh, you know, and what has most uh, impact. That has the most impact, way more than any technical advice you're going to give or any policy you're going to sell. Mm. Way more. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. One last, uh, this will be the best way to come out is uh, uh, to leave, not a question, but a comment. Great presentation. Thank you for keeping with the structure, not the numbers. Well, I thank whoever that is. Um, you know, thank you. I'll write you a check later on. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay. Again, Peter at Seligman.ca. If you have any questions, give me a holler. I'll be happy to, to get back to you guys. And uh, I only wish we could have a breakout session and, and share some yogurt and fruit in the lobby or whatever. Yeah, Cookies. Absolutely. I always, hey, gain weight, I, always, I always gain weight at the, at the elite because it's way more food than I normally have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you and me both. Hey, thank Great you job. so much, Hemel and uh, Peter. And uh, with that, uh, our session is over. Thank you, everyone, thank for you. attending. Thank you. Bye.